Hello everyone and welcome to Discraft Presents Sun King's Throw Down the Mountain 9. We're here at the Grand Canyon Gold Course for round number two. A front nine action coming at you. Commentary is going to be solo from myself. That is the most efficient way to get the coverage out and available to you right away. We've got touring pros traveling all around the country and while I'm back in Wisconsin for just a couple days, this is the best way to get it out immediately. We start on hole number one, 318 feet uphill. Place at least 350 feet. We have a look to the left if somebody wants to go with a forehand shot. Or Aaron Doyle, our leader, is going to go right up the gut on the right side. Not enough turn as that's leaking to that left side, just barely f carrying over the edge. Aaron opened with that nine under par during the opening round and pretty impressive as that's rated a 10.59. Aaron's 1,006 rated. And of course, now we have Florida's own Charlie Goodpasture. Castaplast sponsored player. We might have some giveaways related to that, thanks to Charlie. Charlie's six under in the opening round, rated 1046. And Justin Banal. Guy out of the Midwest, someone I have actually known for more than 20 years. He was in the St. Louis area, he worked at Gateway Disc Sports for quite a few years. He's a very talented individual and after a few years off he's picked disc golf back up he's now in the nashville area he's got a job that allows him to travel a little bit more and it's going to be a treat to watch the skills of justin bennell his pdj number is the lowest in the mpo field 20827 that's really more of just a time stamp and of course discraft's own tim barham we saw him in round number one. Him and Justin had shot that four under. That was unofficially rated at 1025. It was this forehand a little bit short on the right side. Aaron can only be so aggressive there. That was a good bid from where he was at. Obviously. Uh, from about circle two or just outside of it, but the edge of the the platform there, it, it, it goes off pretty quickly. So even Tim here, maybe a little bit tentative. Oh, no. Or, or the right amount of power and speed, but a few inches right. Good pasture, I believe, putts with a Rico by Castaplas. And he's on the board. Good putt to open the round. Justin, I believe, in that 38, 39 age range. Again, been playing for many years. So I'm frequent the Midwest and came up to a few big tournaments in Wisconsin way back in the early 2000s. And Aaron and Tim will tap in for their pars throughout the round. I'm going to do my best. I'll give you a few stats and figures as to how the course played for our competitors. But now we go over to hole number two, 646 feet, going up the gut. You're looking for a landing zone. That kind of darker area on the bottom right there is one of the, the main landmarks that are out here. If you get it anywhere near that, you've probably thrown a really good shot. Here's
here the winds pick up. It's about 2.30 Eastern time, maybe 2.45 at this point. And a great shot for good pasture. Anything that penetrates all the way through the gap, and as long as it doesn't hyzer too much and then finish really hard to the left, it's probably going to be about as good as you can do. But you have to penetrate through this gap. Good looking shot by Justin. We'll see what that leaves him. They're not making this gap look quite as daunting as it really is. Oh my God. And you hear Tim realizing the early release is probably going to be punishing. We saw an incredible by, uh, forehand by Cole in round number one. We'll see if Tim can duplicate that effort. And, and from where he is, that's about as good of a shot as he could have thrown. And then you see there's a, a little bit of a painted line. That was the dark spot I was talking about during the drone preview. That is just casual relief. It gets really muddy, and, and there's just a weird low spot there where things can get really wet and slick and Not enough hope on it, you know? just flat out muddy and... <laughs> There's, there's the line you see a little bit better, but that's just played as casual. Aaron's going to go up and around, and at that point, you're just trying to punch through. You're, you're throwing it up into that direction and just hoping that it kind of just filters through. There's a gap, but when you're, I don't know, 150, 200 feet away from it, it's hard to exactly pinpoint an 8-foot gap. <laughs> and Park. Park. Justin, a little bit of confusion. There was a, a huge. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think it was barbed wire. A couple spotters out there uh, thought they had a good eye on it, but I think the, the eruption and the noise we heard was coming from a different hole. And so there's just a little confusion as to how great that shot was. Tim and Charlie, not a real good look or opportunity from here just because the green is relatively protected. And as you can see, even just getting your footing is a little bit of a challenge. I believe that's a Berg by Charlie. We see, we'll see him approach with that quite a bit. And then Justin was not quite the five feet he was promised. And playing very smart and conservative. He didn't have a good look at it. You see, had he gone deep, he would have possibly landed more so where Aaron is. So Justin's under the basket. Now Aaron's under the basket for his par. Solid putt by Good Pasture. Hole two, definitely one of the tougher holes to get a birdie on out on this particular course or this layout. If I get clever, I might be able to give you guys a little bit of statistics. Yeah, it averages 4.2. So it does average over par. And comes in as... Um, roughly the 13th or 14th easiest hole. So certainly not a, a must-get birdie by any means. And now we move over to hole number three. You're throwing off of a shelf. 
the perfect landing zone is right about here. However, you're going to probably have goofy footing or an awkward stance. And then you're trying to throw uh, probably, like I said, a standstill shot that might put you up near this pin. But the pin sits on a spine, a little bit of an incline there. And so you have to be really delicate around the putting green. And this certainly one of the opportunities where I do wish he had a catch cam. This end hole, too. Those tee shots are relatively blind, but that was a good shot by Charlie. I feel like the mistake you don't want to make is to throw short. If you're short, you don't make it onto the roadside or the, the uphill incline, and then you have a really cut-off angle from that short left side. You'd rather go a little bit long, a little bit straighter, than to be short and left. Aaron seems okay with that. Don't smile, Aaron. Don't smile. And this hole comes in as the fifth hardest hole on the course, averaging .33 above par. So if you're taking a par or even the elusive birdie, you're definitely gaining strokes on the field. I like the height, but we'll see if that's short. <laughs> Tim gives us a smile as he <laughs> maybe have found a line he wasn't necessarily uh, hunting down. And here's the stance I talk about. Charlie realizing how difficult that stance is and I, I give anyone credit this is an opportunity where if you have a forehand and you're in the right position for it just a standstill forehand feels like such a a useful tool when you're in a position like this and a lot of people will say a forehand can be so good when you don't have the opportunity for a flat or a an even run up Aaron's patent pending well, might need to reapply. <laughs> this isn't good. I'm already laughing at my own jokes as we go. But here's Justin. Here's, again, the footing. It actually looks like his back foot there is on almost even ground with his, with his front foot, which is a huge advantage. Because most of the time when you're on this hillside, you're going to have your left foot way down and behind you. And Justin takes advantage of that. And that is a really good shot. We talked in the first round about the single tree that you need to beat. And it feels like nine out of ten times if you hit the tree on the approach, it kicks to the right and then will kick you over the fence. That main single tree up there in front of us. I'd name the tree, but I'm not smart enough to know for sure. So I'll just say it's a tree. But if you hit that, it feels like it always kicks to the right and always kicks out of bounds. Tim inside of it. Please. Oh, good. Oh, that thing fades. It's okay. I'm nervous. It's going to be close. I think that's going to be a good shot for him. And here's one of many pro tips a lob out there. Go practice this kind of a shot. Of course, if you've got a forehand, that might be a good alternative, putting your left foot up there and reaching out to the right, or just practicing that shot as a backhand player because it's really awkward, but it's good to have. He didn't call that. So. <laughs> Charlie and Justin and everybody else knowing he got a little lucky there. Rolling back down right to the pin for him. Justin's approach had gone deep of the basket. He's putting back at the OB road. Or the OB fence line first, I should say. Not really a factor, but rollaways are. 
or putting it right into the center of the chains. That works too. The standing rule at the event is anytime you're next to a barbed wire fence, you get a two meter relief. Typically you have a one meter relief from any kind of OB or, well, any OB line, but they've made a special provision that you can take up to two meters anytime you're next to barbed wire fencing. And uh, big hugs. I believe we found out much later that that ambulance was actually coming to the course to uh, address a medical condition from someone on the course. So big hugs and speedy recovery to everyone involved. I, th I believe they're all good now, but. <laughs> and maybe you can tell, I actually had to adjust some of the volume here on hole three because it is incredibly loud as those cars go ripping through there. But now, Paralleling still the road, hole four, 407 feet. I know I harped on Mike and, and crew during the first round. This is where the pin has been in previous years. I'd love to see it come back to this spot. I feel like it's a little bit more attackable. So pretend that they're throwing to that spot and then add about 40 or 50 feet. Maybe it's only 35, but the pin where it was in that previous drone preview, I feel like just makes it a much better opportunity for both the short and the long pad for somebody to possibly get the bonus birdie because getting it where it is now is really tough. But we'll see how these guys tackle it. Did I just say these guys? I did. No edit life, bro. Great shot. And maybe no surprise, this does come in as one of the most difficult holes on the course. Nearly perfect shot by Charlie. I mean, of course, you'd love to push a little bit more up that hill, but being center, having a look to even approach up to the basket or maybe a long throw in, is great as Aaron finds center tree, kicks hard right. Aaron doing the best he can to pop out to the fairway. There was just one birdie on this hole in the first round. I believe that was Bart. Aaron for his second patent pending approach. And he could have done without that kick. <laughs> Should be a routine approach here for Barham. Center fairway is so crucial on this on this particular drive. Just it gives you a couple lanes to look at the basket. If you want to be aggressive and run it, you can. After working at and being part of Gateway Disc Sports for quite a few years, uh, Justin had taken a few years off, pursued some other endeavors. And uh, just in the last year or so, I believe, picked up by Prodigy. Oh, no. Some people talk about what is an unforced error. 
I feel like that's the definition of one. He had a relatively routine approach shot, uh, the just the difficult level, difficulty level, not overwhelming by any means. Uh, he is thankfully still left with this to possibly save the par. But when I think about a, a oh, just off. But when someone says, well, an unforced error, what in the world does that mean? To me, that's that's kind of how I would define that. Well, that's a perfect example, at least. Solid par for Barham. Of course, Justin looking for the same. seen Aaron's lead that he started with significantly diminish. He had three strokes over second now. Looks like he's all knotted up. And we move over to hole five. Downhill blind hyzer shot off to this left hand side. If you're a righty backhander, of course, it's the hyzer. Uh, the hay bales aren't there. And quite frankly, I'm not sure how much they come into play or even necessarily did a couple years ago. Uh, I do like them, but we see a lot of our players, at least our MPO players, go with a high hyzer shot here. So I go down to the bottom of the hill and I try and catch the swing here during this round. Because during the first round, it was really just a blind shot. So that hits the far tree and kicks back, leaving them somewhere in circle two. him with a pretty similar line but he's going to be short right <laughs> Charlie says he's coming right at me and that kick didn't help now after watching this, these drives a number of times I really do love the low line and of course these are our top players on the lead card they can argue against me all day all right, well, and I guess Aaron's going to say shut up, but I, it just feels like the low line is has a higher percentage of getting through. You're coming in low, good angle, maybe get a skip up. I think it's really tough to park. The, it's tough to park this basket without throwing a perfect shot. So if you can throw a good shot and then skip to within 30, I think that's adequate. But we see a lot of people going with that high hyzer route. Tim's probably close to 70, maybe 75 feet. Justin finds himself at least at 60, maybe 65. Wow, the nonchalant walk-in strike by Justin Bennell. Aaron somehow made it deep of the pin on that left side. Again, a, very effective. It feels like a low percentage shot that we actually see get there but it's going to pay off for him this time. And Charlie and Tim both in for their pars. And now hole number six, one of my favorites out here. You're throwing a hyzer shot. You'd love to land right about here. And then you're going to have either a straight or maybe a little bit of a turnover, backhand turnover, up to this beautiful notch cut out up here. I think it makes for just a perfect green. I'm guessing when Mike and the Sun King crew came out at one point when they, when they came up with this hole just a couple of years ago, <laughs> once you get in there, you're like, oh, yeah, there needs to be a basket in here. 
So I'll go again down to the kind of the swing point. And <laughs> the spotters appreciating. I think Tim and Steve and, uh, again, huge staff and crew out there, volunteers and otherwise, all making this event happen. And those are two great back-to-back -back shots. Surprising to see that this hole is actually the fourth easiest statistically, averaging a 3.72 out of the par four that it is. Another great shot. They really cut out a lot of those, uh, that sawgrass that you saw. Yeah, I just said sawgrass that you saw. Before that was trimmed, like right yeah. about there. Before that was all cut down and trimmed out, it really made every shot so much more crucial as to the exact landing position. But now if you're 20 or 30 feet behind where Justin is, it's it's not a nightmare like it was a few years ago. Just needs the slightest turn to flex up right next to the pin. Great shot by Justin. I think this is a warden that Aaron leans on quite a bit, and it hits the tree, kicks right back to the pin. Charlie running it. Okay. Well, looks like the wind maybe knocked it down at the last minute, but a great shot by Good Pasture. He's right underneath it. And with one of the best drives I've really ever seen, Tim puts himself... I don't know. It's a little bit disheartening that he's left with this now to try and still take the birdie. He had such an incredible drive. Let's see him cash it in. It sits down for him, and that one's going to frustrate him. He, he just really could not have had a better possible drive. And so just to walk away with the pars going to be a little bit frustrating. Easy clean up on aisle six for Justin. Charlie definitely reminiscing about... <laughs> The coverage from a few years ago where out of frustration we watch him rip his wind pants off after climbing through the sawgrass. We're just throwing around plugs left and right, it looks like. DGA, of course, huge supporter. I think we're going to work with DGA for some of the uh, additional rounds here in the coverage. As we're here at the Grand Canyon, hole number seven, straight shot, 338. And this green is arguably the most treacherous on the entire course. Just seems like nothing wants to, nothing wants to stay there. Anytime you get near that basket, it has a tendency to pop up, start rolling down to the right somewhere. This green's provided plenty of headaches throughout the years. Nice straight shot by Justin with just a little bit of hyzer. And we see just how tight and compact these scores are on the top. Nine, seven, eight, Tim right there at five. Oh, no, sit down. That <laughs> looked like it r skipped up, hit the pole, and then rolled backward. At least it didn't roll down into the right, but it did roll backward on him. I 
feel like we see a lot of players really f go back and forth whether they're going to go with a mid or a fairway on this one. Charlie gets a little love. Kicks him back down a little bit closer. I think this is a possibly a buzz by Barham, and that one's going to be short and left. Charlie states that as long as it's not buried in the dirt, he can move it. I'm going to have to look up the PDJ rule book on that one. But uh, he, he can move it. I think it's just a matter of at what point are you defining it as a permanent fixture or not on the course. And then I, I'm, I'm not sure where dirt burying necessarily comes into play. There's Look up the rules is, uh, is what I'd tell everyone to go out there and do and come to your own interpretation. Great shot by Barham. And <laughs> I hate to laugh, but this is nasty how far back this rolled after hitting the pin. Aaron gives it a good run. Oh, no. Uh oh, we need a new S hook. S hook, folks. <laughs> Tim. Making the fix and Justin's tee shot. He this guy is on a roll. He started at remember, he started at four under, both him and Barham. So in the first seven holes, we see Justin five down in the first seven holes of this round, and he has officially pulled into a tie with Aaron Doyle for the lead on this tournament. Incredible start, and of course I encourage all of you to go check out shop.lisopen.com and uh, pick up some of the great Discraft goods and wares from the Ledgestone Insurance Open Tournament. And I know Mike over at Sun King Discs. Make sure you're checking them out, as Mike also carries quite a few of the special Ledgestone releases I think I'm going to have to get a coupon code for some of these sites. Make sure you guys are going out. <laughs> Justin uh, making the joke. That's actually, we find out later, that is, that is our host, my host, Dwayne Reeder, who is the official course superintendent. Uh, he had asked me to bring a saw from his house that morning because there was a, a limb that had broken, and so he wanted to get it cleared out on the previous hole. So after everyone played it during the second round, he was taking the saw to the tree to uh, officially remove the, the dangerous limb. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was doing it immediately following uh, these guys playing it, and they could actually hear him sawing away. So Justin had... Made the joke. <laughs> and and he's continuing on this heater. I said he's five under through seven holes. Hole eight feels like a bonus at each and every year if you can get up there for a birdie. It averages over par at 3.25. So if you're if you have even a, a remote chance at a birdie, you've done something right. Aaron goes high and left, but it's fading back. One of the new things that's been added to hole this year is the far left side that actually kind of is adjacent, I think that's my word, is adjacent and butts up against hole 18. So they've put in an actual defined OB line that if you go too far left, you'll find yourself in what is considered hole 18 and out of bounds. So if this hole isn't difficult enough, 
they've added some OB to make it even more challenging. Charlie with the Berg, maybe a little bit short. Really tough to get a blind high turnover shot at just the right speed up there. Great forehand by Barham, reaching out to his right from one knee. And now Aaron is short and right and is going to try and punch through. Oh. <laughs> punch through too easily and then hit something on the backside that kicks him back toward the pin. So a little bit of a fortunate break there. This is Charlie to try and save his par. Huge shout out to Mike Barnett and all of Sun King and the staff and the crew. I just cannot say it enough times about all the work, Dwayne Reeder, uh, all the work that goes into making this course available for a temporary layout just for about one month out of the year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The double, the double fist pump. Great save by Good Pasture. Also, good save by Doyle. <laughs> good pasture said his three still feels like a birdie. Again, this average 3.25. Not a lot of birdies given up here. In fact, just five birdies given up on the day, and you just saw one of them, a park job. I'm not sure how many others were that close, but a park job by Justin. And he moves to 10 under on the round, or uh, correction, 10 under overall, six under in the first eight holes. So we go to hole nine, 344 feet. Get out your yarn you gotta lace it i i don't know there's a lace joke in there somewhere you need to lace one down the fairway here though most of our players will take that right side route if you really want to flex one to the left of this initial tree you could but with where the tee pads angled more often than not you're just seeing people go up the right side and this just needs to be on a frozen rope And although it gets a little bit of a roll, it checks up, and we'll be looking at about a 30-footer. Charlie's, oh, that was looking good. Maybe a little bit high, of course, it hit the branches, but in general, it was a little bit high. pops up and he just gets over on it too much. We'll see how much ground he can still cover. It looked like it kept going. As he said, he <laughs> hit his line, but. Fortunately, Tim squares the tree. Now, if we're looking for a silver lining here, that kick was about as neutral as it could have possibly been for him. Uh, this could have went, I mean, that could have carried all the way down to the fence line, found OB. I mean, that, that could have been really terrible. But it stops right in the fairway. He basically stopped at the shorter tee. He squares that additional tree down there. Again, that one kind of stops for him. And I'm not implying that this is all great news for him, but uh, it, it could have been much, much worse in both instances.
I think it may have. Ah, good shot for good pasture. Now, here's what I need. You, you guys know I always just say it's the do the YouTube stuff, but like, share, comment, all that obvious stuff. I've been working with Double G Craft Jerky now for a couple of events. We are sending out jerky to you guys. You may not get a choice as to which of the four or five flavors. I may just send you some, but we've got that, and I've got discs to give away. There's going to be some Patreon-exclusive giveaways, but this one's going to be generic, so anyone that comments in the YouTube section will then automatically be eligible. Hopefully it's a positive comment, something nice, but it doesn't have to be. You can tell me how my solo commentary is the worst ever. Okay. But make sure you leave a comment, and that will make you eligible for the giveaway action. Here's Justin. Little uphill putt. Got to get over the edge. Oh. Who's doubting that guy? Unbelievable. As he is going to close out the front nine with seven under par. Uh, and really, he missed hole four, which is the second most difficult hole on the course. And he missed hole two, which isn't easy. <laughs> so clearly not a perfect front nine, but pretty damn close. Charlie's going to wait for a distant distraction. I don't know if everybody just likes to drive really loud and fast or if the road noise is just, if that road has an amplifier on it, but it's always coming in hot. So that's what you see, guys. Again, so glad you could join us. And we'll take a quick look at what we're seeing for the scores here. Uh, Aaron remains at that nine under, but Justin, I think, is the real story here. He currently seven under through this front nine like share subscribe you're eligible for the giveaways thanks to all the sponsors and supporters and we'll see you for the back nine